you know that you know. Um, simple, simple enough. When we, when you talk about the uh, Noble Eightfold Path, the first part of the path you notice in that list, and the list is works as a as a unit, as a piece. But the right understanding, I would see, is both. Um, it has a intellectual p component, and as I mentioned now, this kind of existential part to it. So the intellectual component is important um, because Theravada Buddhism is is a set of ideas which reinforce each other, um, and it's designed for liberation. It's not it's not a kind of philosophical system which is abstract. It's designed to people for people to contemplate and reflect upon and then take deeply with the intention of liberation from suffering the realization of the unconditioned or nibbana and intellectually the there's i, I would say there's sort of the two extremes that that uh, western meditators quite often get into or anyone i suppose one is to not not do the homework of intellectual rigor which is required to actually study um, the, the kind of basics. That's one extreme. So that kind of a person can sort of kind of know what's being talked about, but then might then uh, read a poem by Rilke or uh, a poem by um, Mary Oliver, or then might look at some Tibetan stuff and then might look at psychotherapy and have a kind of range of ideas which might be inspiring at times, but quite often wouldn't have a kind of consistency, not that any of those would be wrong. So like if one is studying a Tibetan Buddhism, one needs to understand Tibetan Buddhism. If one's studying Theravada, one needs to study Theravada. And, and some of the language that Tibetan Buddhism uses and Theravada uses is used in different ways. Even the word Buddha is used in different ways. Not that either one is right or wrong, but there's an intellectual consistency to any, um, any, any, any agreed format or structure of, of thought and ideas. So I would suggest to those of you who, who haven't really done the homework of, of, of uh, intellectually understanding all the bits and pieces that you, you do try to get your head around the whole thing. That took me some time, obviously, as a, as a young monk. So if, if I were to say to you, do you, do you know the, uh, uh, what the relationship of dependent and origination is in the Four Noble Truths? Can you understand that language? If you can't, then it would be good to study that. Or why do we, what, why, you know, what's the big deal about craving and desire? Or why do we talk about uh, change and, and is there no self in Buddhism? True or not true? Huh? So, so these kinds of questions you might get on an exam, but you know I don't I don't do exams because <laughs> I dropped out of university. Maybe that's why. <laughs> but uh, but it is important because um, if you get the whole piece, it makes a lot of sense. And then that uh, alleviates a lot of doubt, a lot of intellectual doubt, and gives your, your, your mind a firm direction on why the Buddha is saying what he says in Theravada Buddhism, why these words are used and why these concepts are used. So that's very, very helpful. I don't do that. I'm not, a, I'm not that, I don't make that kind of presentation. So uh, I assume that the people listening have a good grounding in Theravada Buddhism. Otherwise, uh, I would suggest that to, do that, do that work. The other, the other I, I would say, the other extreme of um, right understanding in the intellectual part of it is overly studying. And that's like just accumulating more and more and more and more knowledge, more and more knowledge, more and more information about Theravada Buddhism or other kinds of Buddhism, it doesn't really matter. And that's okay for a scholar and a translator and a teacher in that vein. It's, it's good that they have a lot of knowledge. But it's not about an encyclopedic understanding of Buddhism, because that's, that's, that's just trying to figure it out through thought. But that's not the point of it. So the point of Theravada Buddhism is, is reflection. So if I, if I take 
like desire. Why does the Buddha talk about desire? What's what's tanha? What's craving? What's uh, bhavatana, vibhavatana? What's kamatana? All these different words. What is craving to become? Craving to get rid of? If I really pondered that and 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 considered that intellectually, then existentially in my existence, I begin that begins to come up into my mind as a way of observation. So through the Buddha's recommendations, my laboratory called my mind and my life is my little laboratory i apply those principles to the very nature of my frustrations or my joys or sorrows or suffering whatever i apply the buddha's words to that to my existence and then those same insights that the buddha had should come to me so i'm given i have a direction now of inquiry but it's not about belief i mean i could i have faith in in, in the teaching, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't do it. But it's not about believing it. It's rather about applying it. And that's where the existential part of right understanding, so the intellectual existential. And so the beginning of the existential part of right understanding is it's like this. You know that you know, because then you understand this moment. And then from that uh, understanding of this moment, be it good or bad, be it pleasant or unpleasant, you can begin to think rightly right thought. And what is right thinking? Well, you, you bring up into consciousness thoughts, ideas, perceptions, which will be helpful for liberation. So one typical example I always talk about is when I, when I went to Thailand, I was a young monk in 1973 or whatever, and um, the, one of the basic recommendations on perception that Ajahn Chah gave us and the text gave us was contentment with little. And that's a, that's a perception, or an idea, or a thought. Uh, be content with little. Now, I wasn't content with little. You know, I wanted, I wanted a zafu, and we only had concrete. Uh, I wanted yogurt, and they hadn't seen it in their whole lives, or whatever it was. And I can be quite jokey about that now, but it was quite painful. <laughs> it was quite suffering, because I didn't get what I wanted. And then Ajahn Chah would say, yeah, but why don't you just try the perception of being content with little. So I began to introduce that right thinking into my mind, contentment with little. Now that wasn't an absolute which I was trying to force myself to be. It was rather an idea or a perception off of which I could look at what my mind was doing. What my mind was doing was being discontent, being uh, grumpy or, or wanting more or whatever, wanting different. And then, so that perception, right thought, from the right understanding, both intellectually and existentially, I bring that up, be con uh, uh, content with little, just as an idea, and then I would see discontent as an object. Whereas before, when I didn't have that way of operating as a, as a reflective tool, say, then when I feel the discontent, I either feel guilty, oh, I shouldn't be discontent, I should be content, or I just complain. One extreme is getting rid of, the other extreme is indulging. And then no, no, I just say, no, no, it's just awaken to the feeling of discontent, trust that. So then as I woke into the feeling of discontent, I was practicing content with a little, right? It's not that I forced myself to be content, it's more like, oh, discontent feels like this. And then the power of discontent began to dissipate. You see what I mean? Not because I was idealizing what I should be as a mom, and not that I was, you know, kind of forcing myself to be content, I couldn't. The way I'd been conditioned was to, to get stuff that I wanted, get food that I wanted, get experiences that I wanted. So I had to live with that karma, with the resultant karma of discontent. But, but I could awaken to it. It's like this. Discontent feels like this. Now that I know. And then put in right thinking. Content with little. Content with little. Which wasn't a demand, right? It was, no, it's a different way of observing. And then I could, yeah, I could be content with little. And then five minutes later, complain again. Oh, yeah, do it again. I don't want to, I don't have a mosquito in that, it's too many mosquitoes. Uh, content with a little. Okay. And then two minutes later, complain again. Right? And that's what the training is about. You, you bring up the awakened mind, you put into the mind perceptions which are skillful and helpful to your own life, to, you know, to whatever you're experiencing. And, and then you train, you train in that direction. You're very gentle. It's very, very, um, and it's very wise. In the sense, it's not idealistic. It's not just like, I shouldn't be like this. I should be something else. Rather, it's the wisdom of understanding cause and effect. 
and then your own, your own conditioning, and then putting in the right sort of information, the right thinking for yourself. But you see how it, it begins both in intellectually, with understanding what the path is about, but as existentially, it begins with that awakened mind. You know that you know. So, hope that makes sense. <laughs> um, makes sense to me. Um, so, do 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 consider that in terms of what knowledge you have. Um, also, I assume in this kind of gathering that everyone's committed to sila. You know that we're all committed to the five precepts. Um, to a life of, of moral integrity. I always assume that. If you don't, um, please do. <laughs> so like if someone is like smoking grass right now, um, I turn off the television. <laughs> because these kinds of things just confuse the mind, don't they, right? So there's like a commitment to moral, moral, um, moral clarity, really. So non-violence, uh, non-corruption, non-promiscuity, fidelity, truthfulness, all these things are very beautiful and they're the foundation for doing this kind of work. If you don't have that foundation of, of, of moral integrity, then of course the mind has to deal with all that, all that confusion and remorse. And then also I assume in this kind of a gathering that we're also committed to generosity. You know, we're committed to, to social justice, um, to caring for our trees and our water, and uh, our, our fruit trees are really blooming this year. So we've had uh, tons and tons of bumblebees the lilacs and the apples and the cherries and the service berry and all kinds of trees. So we have a commitment to our environment, right? And that's all part of generosity and service and, and uh, caring for who you are yourself, who your family is, who your relationships are, your environment and your social culture. So that's dana and, and generosity and so on. So those are very, very necessary parts before before one gets into meditation, if one doesn't have that, then meditation can sometimes become a kind of selfishness. It's, it's not about selfishness, it's about uh, putting an end to selfishness, isn't it? You know, it's about liberating the mind. And so uh, a, a life which is imbued with generous action has much more joy in it. A life w which is imbued with uh, moral integrity has much more joy in it and makes meditation much easier. Uh, so do the best you can uh, on that, but it's, it's quite important. So let me see. We can, we're going to, you know, so we'll have another meditation, but may I just, um, may I, as you know, those of you who have done retreats with me, I, I, these days I recommend uh, people who are over 25 <laughs> to try lying meditation. <laughs> I used to say over 70, but everyone's allowed. Um, so uh, as, as, as you know, I, I, uh, I sometimes have a, quite a lot, no, not a lot, but uh, knee problems, which are not, not really problematic, they're just ordinary for my age, but they make meditation uh, in, sometimes a kind of endurance contest. And I can, I can endure, I know how to endure, and I know how to be sort of at peace with discomfort, but I have found that lying meditation um, is, is very instructive because then there's no necessity to be concerned about um, the uprightness of the body or the physical pain. So I've found a way of meditating a lying down which is quite comfortable and um, very interesting in terms of then just viewing the mind and seeing what the mind is doing. So as, you, as many of you know, the way I recommend lying meditation is to Lay down first. <laughs> Statement of the obvious. <laughs> so once you've laid down, um, then you'll fall asleep. So, okay, how do you deal with that? Well, the way you deal with that is to have a good rest. So having had a good rest <laughs> and a cup of coffee, whatever you want, to go back to, back to the lying posture um, and lay down and, and, and set up your posture such that I would say that your knees are not flat but they have some flex in them. So you could put a bolster or a pillow under your knees because when the knees are flat for an hour, they can start to, start to hurt because it's stretching out, mind, mind you. So if you put something under the knees so they're flexed, that's helpful. And, and then see about the small of your back. But set up the postures so that it is comfortable. 
and and that you could you could sustain it for a long period of time, say an hour, forty five minutes. And then, having set up the posture, um, look at look at setting it up really well, very calmly, and then adjust it another five percent, say another five percent where you're. You kind of, you know, because when you when you when you settle down, then you want to readjust it. Okay, readjust the five percent more, and then stop, stop the readjusting. Okay, so now take the posture, and now make a determination not to move, not to be rigid, but not to move. And you'll find within thirty seconds you want to move. There'll be a little bit of itching, or a bit of you want to scratch something, or you think, oh, my neck is a bit this way. Or my chin is a bit, don't do it, right? Don't do it. And, and that is the, the, the basic training in lying meditation is to not move. And so what happens is, sure, certainly some people fall asleep and they start to snore, but the snoring will eventually wake you up. But if you've got enough energy, then when you lay down, when you want to, to move, that's a desire arising, the desire to move. Now, you know darn well it's not, uh, physically threatening. You're not going to get hurt. If you are going to get hurt, obviously you will move. But you know it's not. So what you have is you have an unpleasant sensation called itching. And then you have the desire to scratch. But you don't scratch. You just watch itching. Or you have a sense of discomfort in the left side of your neck. And then you, you have a desire to move the left side of your neck. You don't move. You just stay with the posture, stay with it. not rigidly, you just stay with the posture. So those little incidences of discomfort and the desire to move become the object of the meditation. And because now you're practicing awareness of desire, right, um, your, your mind has a chance to settle in. Now what you really need to do is you need to have good body awareness. Because obviously the, the big problem is you're going to fantasize or think or where your mind's going to go off into thought. But... Uh, what I found is because the because when you're heedless, you move, you move your body around. You a lot of thinking. If you really use that the, the body, so you want to just come into the, uh, a whole body awareness. You feel the weight of the of the uh, of the whatever surface you're on. You feel your shoulders. Feel your breath. Just this whole body awareness, and you bring your attention from thinking into the body, from thinking into the body. So you're coming down into the body, into the body. You don't have to localize. It's not constant. You can. You can, but just a sense of whole body awareness away from thought, away from analysis, away from all of that. That takes some training. But you'll find that if you, if you can develop this, especially as you get older, it's harder to sit, um, it's a very profitable posture. And then if you kind of get good at it, then you'll find that like if you have um, insomnia, you can't fall asleep, then quite often you'll go to that posture and you'll actually, you may be made to fall asleep, but you'll be feel very rested because your mind and body will be rested in the, in the lying posture. So it's very profitable to try to explore that. It's one of the four classical postures. So during this, this, this day, day of mindfulness, you might try that if you want. Put your alarm on in case you fall asleep. <laughs> you might cover all your bets. <laughs> um, but it is, it is very good. So sometimes I'll, I'll alternate between uh, sitting and lying, sitting and lying, or lying and walking, lying and walking like that. But I have found that, that uh, once you understand this, you can, like, to do a two-hour meditation is no problem because the body's not, not, not stressed. But if you're not used to sitting, it can be quite difficult. So do, do try that. Do, do experiment with that. People have joked that we should do a, 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 a retreat with lying meditation where, where I would be uh, on the stage lying down and I have mirrors in the ceiling and I could look at everyone else lying down, but, but the technology is too difficult, so we won't do that. <laughs> but uh, I give it a go. So um, in, in getting back to meditation, if you, come to, if you, if you use this, this idea, uh, I know that I know, and then having established that, enter or, or um, put into consciousness right thought. Put in a thought which will really help you in the meditation. So it might be like uh, non-becoming or, or uh, uh, acceptance. Or it might be just, may all beings be free from suffering. 
It might be like one I used for a couple of years, as many of you know, infinite patience, boundless compassion. And what happens if you do that? Say, so you know that you know, yeah? And then you start to put into consciousness quite deliberately, infinite patience, boundless compassion. What happens? The attitude of mind is going to shift and drift towards that, isn't it? Because that's what you're suggesting. And then you get impatient or you fall asleep or whatever. And then I know that I know infinite patience, boundless compassion. Now you're saying it into the mind very deliberately. It's not like you're just in, it's just a kind of a, 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 an abstract thing that you're thinking. It's like infinite patience, you're very, very mindful. So then you can see how you can use mantra or, or chanting or even analysis in a skillful way. So the example I like to give is the Mecca chant that we have. This is what should be done. Now, many of you know that, and I think it's in some of the texts you have, but to actually say that deliberately, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble, not conceited. You know, and to do that deliberately takes mindfulness, focus, right? And then if you're, if you're going with the, the underlying perceptions, they're, they're very beautiful. So you can see how you could introduce a meditation with thought, not with, you know, the, the, the babbling of the mind, but with deliberate, deliberate thinking or right thinking. And then if you, if you, if you devise those thoughts, it could be a poem, a deliberate poem, or, or a part of a sutta, whatever you want. A gata, I think Thich Nhat Hanh uses gata as a lot, right? Um, use that, but you do it very deliberately, for my, not just kind of, oh yeah, yeah, I do my gata, I do my, yeah, this is what should be done, and you think about something else, but you do it very deliberately, and put it out there, and you create those perceptions which will be helpful for you. So if you're very self-critical, right, uh, and, 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 you, and your mind just goes into self-judgment all, all the time, always self-critical, so what kind of language would balance that? It wouldn't be, you're an idiot, you're a dumbo. That's, <laughs> that wouldn't be the language. It might be, uh, no problem. Or it might be, I love you, you're a dumbo. Or uh, it might be silence. You just might use that word, just silence or something, right? So you, you, want to, you want to devise your own meditation around your own character. But it always comes from you know that you know. It always comes from that. It doesn't come from desire or idealism. It comes from presence and then putting out the perceptions which might be helpful. At least that's, that's the way I've been trained in, in the use of perception. So when we talk about satipanya or sati, it is, it is not just a functional uh, presence. So I don't, so I don't drop the the the, uh, the sugar bowl on the floor. We all do that, but rather it's it's thematic. Very often, mindfulness of the breath, mindfulness of compassion, or with compassion, mindfulness with breathing. I think with is a better word. Mindfulness with breathing, mindfulness with a perception of change. This is changing, not not a not a not a belief, but oh, this is changing, and you notice change. You see. That's what sati has in it. That's what mindfulness has in it. 